Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here today. Uh, my name is Don Moynihan. I'm the director of the La Follette School of Public Affairs. Today's event is part of our regular La Follette School seminar series. They usually happen at the actual La Follette School on campus, but we thought since there was going to be a few more people um, from outside the university today, we uh, have it in a little bit more of a communal setting. Uh, this event is also co-sponsored by Profs. Michelle is here from Profs. Thank you for co-sponsoring this. Uh, we welcome you here. This is, I think, a really interesting public policy story we're going to hear about today. Our guest is Gary Gates. He was, for a couple of decades, the person who was in charge of Wisconsin's multi-billion pension system. How many people here are currently invested in the Wisconsin public pension system? So everyone basically except for the students, and the students might be in a few years. Um, uh, this is a, a, a unique system. It has an element of risk sharing that's unusual from the perspective of someone who hopes to receive this pension system in a couple of decades from now. I'm reassured by the fact that it's fully funded, unlike many of our neighbors, such as our neighbors to the south in Illinois. Um, and, and if you look around, uh, um, from a public policy perspective, one of the biggest challenges a lot of states are facing are these unfunded liabilities um, from their public pension systems. Uh, we are in a happy position in Wisconsin where that has not been the case, in large part thanks to people like Gary, who uh, did a lot of very clever work in designing this system to minimize the type of risks we see in other states. Um, I'm not going to say too much more about Gary. He's going to talk about the history of how the pension system evolved and I think his role in that. Um, what I will say is that I have asked him to think not just about the history but where the system is going to move from here in the future to help us uh, facilitate that discussion. I've also asked uh, La Follette School and School of Human Ecology Professor Michael Collins to join us. He's the director of the Center for Financial Literacy and someone who is an expert on public pension systems. Um, so he'll be part of the discussion and will also help to moderate your questions. Uh, with that, let me introduce Gary. Come on up. I, before I start talking about the retirement systems, I want to make a personal note. Every couple of years, for many years, I have had an attack of vertigo. I had one yesterday and it's still there. So if I'm staggering around, it's not that I've been drinking. <laughs> um, it is a just unpleasant experience, but it happens every once in a while. And I, fortunately, I can stand up straight now. Yesterday, I couldn't stand up straight. Um, the Wisconsin retirement system uh, was created, I think, if my memory, memory serves me right, in 1973 or 74, 74 probably. But the history of it goes back a lot farther than that. And uh, I have got a whole host of notes of things I might talk about. And if I get through them all, I'm going to be disappointed. And you'll be asleep. Because uh, history is, at least I don't think, is all that terribly interesting. Um, the one thing that we joked about, joke about as a retirement administrators is there are three stages in people's lives as to their interest in retirement. When the 20s and 30s, why the hell have to put money in there? I got better things to do with it. In the 40s, 50s, they say, oh, well, I guess I'm going to be drying out, okay. And in their 50s and 60s, they say, why can't I get more money out? <laughs> and that is very true. That, I don't think it never thought it was that great a joke, but it is very illustrative of the problem. Uh, people have very short-term thinking. Retirement is a long-term proposition. And how do you get people to care when the 20s and 30s, what's going to happen when they're 50 or 60? Oh, I might not live that long. It's more important, I've got to raise the kids, I've got to pay for the house, I've got to pay for a car, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. Uh, I don't know, why do I want to put all this money aside for later in life? So that's, uh, I think, the key problem of getting a good retirement system is how do we 
make it look at the future. Now, there are some uh, factors that get people to look at it. Uh, unions have that, are, can find that they can tell people how they're getting all these great benefits and it doesn't have to take, come out of your paycheck right now, it's going to be, but you, we're getting you great benefits. And management says, say, look at it and say, well, uh, we'll promise it in the future, but we won't pay for it now, therefore we don't have to raise the taxes right now. Uh, long term in the legislature often is the next election. And retirement has to go a little farther ahead than the next election. Um, I, so that, that's the basic nut, nub of the problem of, the, uh, of retirement systems. And the question is, Wisconsin hasn't really had that problem, not that it, it's overcome the problem, I guess you could say. It is one of the best funded systems in the nation. And I, when I say best funded, I mean that not just state and local, but uh, a lot of the private pension plans have funding problems. And the government has, the federal government stepped in and given a benefit, pension benefit guarantee corporation to try to pick up some of the liability of the private plans. Uh, so it, it, it isn't just state and local governments that have the problem, it's all parts of the economy. Now I did want to emphasize that, as I said, if I get through all the th points I've got here, I'm gonna be disappointed. I want your questions, when you have them, come up with them. Don't wait for later. Uh, I, I'm not a great speaker, and nobody is a great speaker after 20, 30 minutes. So interrupt me if, anytime you want to. Um, I've, um, I also want to note that in, I didn't really do any research for today's presentation. I was involved with the retirement system for 30 years. I retired 25 years ago. And I uh, haven't paid much attention to it since. Uh, but after, in the, during those 30 years, I was very much involved with it, I lived and breathed it. Uh, and it's, so I, I'm going mostly in my memory, and mostly I don't think it has changed that much. There have been changes, there always are changes, but it's been a pretty stable system. Uh, it's been able to be stable because it is well funded, and there have been a lot of built-in protections in the system. Uh, the uh, individual, the unions, as I noted, work to make p benefits for the members. One of the common problems is that they can say to their members, we got these benefits for you, for, but, and we don't have to, uh, and, and managers really give, really willing to give these benefits away because we don't have to pay for them right now. And that, that's the road to an unfunded pension plan. Uh, and I can't say that Wisconsin totally avoided that problem, but it's overcome it. Uh, both management and unions have this short-term orientation, and they have a, and when they get together and negotiate collective bargaining, well, let's see, what, what can we do without raising taxes right now? And um, benefits down the road are one way to do it. Um, I would note that the unions, employee state, the state employee unions, there weren't any until, I think, well, the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s, state employees union came into existence. Before that, there was a Wisconsin State Employees Association, which was totally voluntary, and they didn't have any negotiating law power. They were basically lobbyists. And from my own personal viewpoint, they were far more effective for the welfare of the employees than the unions were after they got the collective bargaining power because they made their efforts to keep contact with the legislators, talk about what was necessary, and they weren't in that same uh, adversary role that the unions got in. So I think the unions are a very 
good and necessary uh, institution, but I think that they have to be balanced by management. And I think that uh, from my own viewpoint, the Wisconsin State Employees Association did a as good a job for the retirement system as anybody. The, given the history, the Wisconsin retirement system was created in 1974, I think it was. Um, but the, they were preceded by the state teacher retirement system, the Milwaukee Teacher Retirement Fund, the Wisconsin Retirement Fund, uh, a temporary municipal retirement plans, and Conservation Warden's Pension Fund, and they were all brought together. The city and county of Milwaukee also have retirement funds. They were not brought into the state system. Uh, the city and county of Milwaukee retirement funds are not in good shape. They are poorly funded. Uh, and they have had problems. The county particularly had uh, one of the things you can do with a retirement plan is people often don't understand exactly what's going on and you get, if you play it right, you can get a lot of money out of them without anybody realizing it or getting, by the time they realize it's too late. County had the situation where the county supervisors put some provisions in there where they could take a couple million out for themselves. Uh, that was what the scandal that got Governor Walker elected in the county retirement, county executive. Uh, so, I'm not going to talk more about Milwaukee City and County because I don't have any experience with them other than the fact that I tried to avoid them. Uh, they were, the idea of merging the, the major retirement system into one was, came out of a Governor's Retirement Study Commission in the 1940s. Um, and the Superintendent and State Investment Board came out of that also. The, before that, the Teacher Retirement Fund was a separate fund and a separate department. Milwaukee Teachers was separate. Wisconsin Retirement was separate. There were several small funds around the state. And uh, the governor, they had the effect that the politicians were a little bothered. They'd, the state teacher would come in and ask for a benefit. They'd give it to them. Then the next session, the Wisconsin Retirement Fund wanted the same one and vice versa. And they said, well, in, we could well, look at this and see how do we set this thing up better. And the recommendation was that we, all the funds should be merged and all benefits should be enacted for everybody, not just for a group or this group or that group, but for everybody. Um, the, now I said this was in the 40s, the late 40s that this Governor's Retirement Study Commission started and it made all these recommendations but getting it done was another question. Uh, the, the Retirement Research Committee was created out of that session and were given the charge that any retirement legislation introduced in the legislature would go through the Retirement Research Committee. And they were, the understanding was that they would insist on making it a uniform of treatment of all the retirement funds so they weren't going in all different directions. And they, do, they did a very good job at it. Um, but it's still bringing the funds, you know, te teachers didn't want to be separate, merged with those general employees. Milwaukee teachers didn't want to be merged with state teachers. And, but in 1968, the Kellogg Reorganization Act, you uh, arranged all of state government and put the retirement funds, Milwaukee, state, Wisconsin Conservation Pension Fund, all under the Department of Employee Trust Funds. Uh, this didn't merge the funds. It just said, they're, okay, here they are, they're in the department. And the department was given the charge to figure out how to merge them. So we spent a long time, because there were different provisions in this plan and that plan, that plan. how do you merge one, these plans together while not hurting anybody and while making a sound system out of it. It took a lot, it took, I think it was 74 before we actually implemented the merger. Um, the, and it required increasing the benefits. 
because how did you get the state teachers to go along with merging with general employees? How do you get general employees to merge with Milwaukee teachers and vice versa? Um, so the benefits were increased. Um, and that was, and since then we had the, Wisconsin, have had the Wisconsin retirement system. Now I'd like to go back, talk about the difference between defined contribution and defined benefits. I don't know, anybody here know what the difference between a con defined contribution, defined benefit plan is? So I one hand, two hands. Let me start out. A defined contribution plan, which is what all of the funds were, that is all the major funds were, before merger, uh, or before, I shouldn't say merger, before 1967, um, no, 66 it was. Uh, at any rate, there were defined contribution plans. And uh, the a defined contribution, it says you put money in the plan, you keep count of the mon money you have in the plan, it's invested, it grows. When it comes to retirement time, you say, oh, you got this amount of money. How much of a benefit can it buy? Uh, you don't know before then exactly what you're going to get in a benefit because it's how much money is there. And uh, employee groups usually didn't like that because they couldn't say to the employee, you're going to have a benefit of such and such. Uh, most public employee plans are defined benefit plans which don't, aren't de determined by the amount of money you have in the fund, but by a formula. Usually years of service times a percentage times your salary. Uh, there can be other formulas, but basically it's, it, how much money is in the fund doesn't determine your benefit. The formula determines your benefit. And then once your benefit is determined, they say, well, okay, we got your benefit. How much money do we have to put in to fund it? Uh, it introduces a um, wild card in the funding because you, know, you have to project, well, what is your salary going to be when you retire? What are the investment earnings going to be? Uh, what are the death rates? Uh, how long are you going to retire, live after you retire? Um, and so forth and so on. And so it's sort of a nebulous to figure out how much money do we actually have to have in there? Uh, when you take a big group, you can figure it out pretty well, actuarial tables. But the question always comes up is what investment rate of return should you project? When I started working with the retirement funds, the projected investment rate was 4% a year. I think, now, I think now it's 7%. And how did it get up to 7%? Well, if you're going to increase benefits, you've got to fund them some way. Well, no, no you don't. If you increase the investment return, you say the investment return is going to be higher, you're going to have more money for investment income. And so far that has worked out fairly well because we've gone into a different environment. Also, when I started with retirement funds, the investment were very different than they are today. The retirement funds were almost totally in bonds or fixed income type securities. And they didn't recognize market gains and losses until they sold the stock, sold the asset. So it was a much lower return environment. Uh, it was in the 50s and 60s that he started saying, well, the stock market gives, in the long run gives a much higher rate of return than bonds and stocks. Why don't we start using the stock market? They also came up with the variable retirement fund, which I don't know how many of you are familiar with the variable, but it, it, and it, I'm not going to talk much about the variable, but it just allowed people to say, I want to take half my money and put it in the stock market, period. And at that time, it was a very smart decision because the, you were comparing competing against a fixed division, the bonds, and a variable division of stocks, and stocks in the long run were going to do a better. Well, as time went by, they decided to change the investment philosophy for the fix. The fix is now about 67% in stocks. So your variable is competing against itself to a large degree in the stock market. Um, any questions? No? Well, I will keep going here and hope I'm making sense to you. Um, the basic elements of a good system then are 
contributions during the working career, investment income during the working career, and trust protection so that the assets aren't frittered away for something else. Um, and the benefit provisions must be, can't be manipulated. Now, I, I don't know of any retirement system that that is totally true. Even the Wisconsin retirement system have ways to manipulate the benefits. It was, was one of the things I just, I tried to prevent in the system. But it, when you have that big of system, people are gonna try. And it was one of my interesting, when I first started working for the state was in 1964. At that time, I was a budget analyst with the state budget office, and I was given the retirement systems as my, one of my benefits, my, one of my agencies, my, or three or four of my agencies. And I was, came in right in the middle of the time when they were going to change from a defined contribution plan to a defined benefit plan. And I, as a budget analyst, said, I don't think that's a good idea. Uh, defined contribution has, is much more precise as to what the funds should be. Uh, if you want to increase benefits, why don't you just increase the money going in? Well, I came in a little late on the process, and I fought it like mad. In fact, I got an audience with the Republican caucus as they were considering the bill, and I gave my pitch as to why they shouldn't pass this bill. And afterwards, three of them came up to me and said, say, can you tell me exactly what this is going to do for my benefit? <laughs> And that was a good lesson. Uh, and I, um, so the, the bill did pass, and, but it was structured in a way that we didn't strictly go to a defined benefit plan. We combined a uh, defined contribution and we still had the defined contribution as an underlying benefit under the defined benefit. Depending upon when you leave the system, what your final salary is, you may still get a defined contribution benefit. Uh, but you can also project as the benefit of a defined benefit plan what your benefit will be when you retire. Uh, it may be more than that, but you've been able to say, well, if my salary is such and such, I know what my benefit's going to be. Of course, projecting what your salary is is almost as difficult as projecting the other thing. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'm curious about how, like, how did that hybrid actually come about? How did the, the question, as I understand it, is how did we happen to come up with this combination of a defined contribution and a defined benefit plan on the same plan? Which, as far as I know, is unique. Um, as I said, all of the systems were defined contribution plans before. And we, in selling this new defined benefit plan, there was a resistance. Some people didn't want to give it up. Uh, two particularly didn't want to give it up were Dean Mark Ingram and Dean Kurt Went from the UW. Uh, but there were others. They, they liked the idea of defined contribution. Uh, so the, the original pro proposal was that it would be a pure defined benefit plan. But to overcome the objections, they said, well, build a defined contribution benefit on top of the defined contributions. Uh, the expectation at that time was that defined benefit would always be better, or in almost in most cases. That hasn't always been the case. But uh, that was what was the initial impetus to have this wedding of the two systems, that, uh, because people didn't want to give up the defined contribution. And to overcome that opposition, they put them together. Uh, and said, well, we'll just put the one on top of the other. And um, it was, as I said, at that time, the interest rates, the investment earnings, weren't high enough that the defined contribution was generally, was normally going to be all that significant. But uh, it did have a real value in terms of the benefits, and, and in particular for someone who comes into the system and leaves in the middle of their career, they leave their money in, the defined contribution will almost always take over and grow, keep growing as investment earnings are credited. The defined benefit doesn't grow and once you've left. So it's been a very beneficial effect for the employees 
And it also has an effect that it, one, of the, one of the benefits of a defined contribution plan is you can measure it very precisely. This is what we say we, is an employee's account. Do we have that money? With the defined benefit, there are all sorts of ways to play around with how much money should we have in there. Uh, as I said, we went from an uh, interest rate assumption of 4% to 7%. We, uh, suddenly, we don't have to have as much money in there. Um, the, and those changes always occurred at times that there were increasing the benefits. Um, the benefits of a defining benefit plan is that you, you can, employee knows what you can say, oh, I can figure out what I think I'm going to get. But uh, if you have to, then you have to say, well, it's, what, to fund it, we, ha we have to know what the investment earnings rate is going to be, and we have to know what the life expectancy is going to be, and we have to know all these other things. So I really f prefer the trying contribution, but I lost that one. Yes, ma'am. Defined contribution and money purchase are exactly the same thing. Uh, defined benefit is any kind of a formula you have that determines the benefit without regard to what the amount of, how much money you have available. Defined contribution and money purchase are just di different terms for you accumulate an amount of money and then determine how, how much benefit it will buy. Okay. Um, I did want to note that, add to my original comment that the short-term thinking is a major problem, that there is another major problem, and that is what's good for me is what's good. Uh, I talked about manipulation of the benefits. Uh, I didn't succeed in every area, but I did succeed in a few of stopping manipulation. One of them was the firefighters. Uh, they were negotiating that they'd inflate the final average salary. Everybody's final average salary in the last year so that they get a higher benefit. So I, uh, I introduced, introduced the ministry of rule that prohibited that. They came in, a delegation came in my office and they said, why are you doing this to us? Everybody else is doing it. And that, I had to admit that there are some other people doing it. It's, uh, they were just doing it more blatantly. Um, the one that, that has always bothered me is the elected officials, but they are a very hard nut to crack. Uh, you have a legislator who's in the legislature for 15, 20 years. His salary is what, I don't know, 35, 40,000 what they're making now. Then they get appointed to a position in the last four years that makes 100,000. And the benefit is determined on 100,000. I, I consider, I, that bothers me, but I never was able to get that one solved. I came up with a system that would solve it, but getting it passed was another question. Um, Any more heroes who want to ask me a question? Yes, Don. I have a question about the politics of this, and how do you maintain, you told me a little bit about this, and maybe Michael has an opinion too, but how do you maintain a firewall between the investments, okay. the nature of the system, and uh, the desire politically to try and sweep the system or take money out for other priorities? Uh, the firewall between taking the money out for other reasons is someone has to constantly fight for it. Um, in my time, there were proposals that the retirement funds be used to build highways. It was a good investment, wasn't it? Uh, there were proposals that we divest from anybody that was invested in South Africa, had operation in South Africa. Hey, it's socially good. Uh, every year, there were different proposals of how we could use the retirement monies to do something else. And they were often decent ideas. I sympathized with them. But that wasn't the purpose of the retirement funds. And if you start using the retirement funds this and for that and for that, pretty soon you aren't going to have money for paying the benefits. 
so one of the things we you have to, you is is that you have to have people who are constantly fighting for good funding. I referred to the Wisconsin State Employees Association at, before the unions. They were very much wanting fund, funding. Uh, Roy Vista, John Lawton, uh, other people were intent on it. Max Sullivan, who was the retirement research director and later employee trust fund secretary before I was, was intent on funding. It was a constant battle when I was secretary to fight off all these good ideas of how the retirement funds could be used for something else. Uh, so that's one firewall. Another firewall, a little less idealistic maybe, and, but it was, and it was, I wasn't the one that had the idea, but it was explained to me when I came into the system. Um, if you in include the legislators and the Supreme Court justice in the system, they'll, help, they'll be more interested in maintaining it. <laughs> um, one of the very basic firewalls is the Supreme Court has held that the Wisconsin retirement system is a contract. It isn't just a, something done by the legislation. Once it's there, it's a contract. You can't be taken away. This gives a real sound. Um, uh, there have been cases where they've tried to take money out of the fund and use it for something else. One of them was under my jurisdiction, Thompson. I told him, don't do it, it won't work. Uh, but if you gotta do it, he said, no, I'm gonna do it. So if you gotta do it, do it this way. I, said, I still don't think it'll work, but I don't think I'll fly, but so he did it the way I told him to. We were taken to court and the courts ruled that it was an unconstitutional violation of the contract. And I think it was $9 million they were trying to take out of the retirement funds. And to make it whole, it cost them about $20 million. So I think after that, they, they quit trying to do that sort of thing. Uh, the other thing that is uh, a firewall, and it's the Wisconsin retirement system covers a lot of people. If you do anything that's going to be very obvious to violate it, you get a lot of people upset. I think, I don't know, I think probably 20% of the, 25% of the population of Wisconsin is either covered by the system or a family member of somebody covered by the system. So when you start violating it, you're apt to get a reaction. Um, the, I, some of those firewalls, I, I'm not sure are as effective as they used to be, but so far they've done the job. Um, I keep worrying that they're going to get breached, but they haven't been yet. The, not in any significant way, anyway. One of the ideas that came in, we, well, Wisconsin, we out invest in Wisconsin businesses, not in national businesses. Well, we fought that and said, you know, you want to have a more diverse investment portfolio. You bend a little bit to win and you say, okay, we'll do a little more in Wisconsin than we do elsewhere. But we don't do it only in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. But we do help try to do it. There was a, I can't remember the name of the company now, one company in southwestern Wisconsin. It's a fairly good sized company, Wisconsin based. It was take, there was got a hostile takeover from some national, and we held a lot of their stock. Did we reject the hostile takeover, or do we make several hundred, several million for the retirement funds? The board said, no, we have to take the, our job is to protect the retirement funds. We, were, we had a meeting with Governor Thompson at, his, at the mansion on that subject. And the board stu stuck to its guns. And the next year, the, some of the board members were replaced. But nevertheless, the board members who have been appointed, for the most part, have believed in me investing for the purposes of the trust. And that, and, uh, that has... I'm not saying that every single board member has been wonderful, but the vast majority have said, whether, even though they aren't under the retirement system, 
We believe that this ought to be kept as an inviolate trust and it ought to be done for the benefit of the members of the trust. Now, I should mention the investment board is a separate de state department from employee trust funds. The, I was always a member of the investment board when I was secretary, and I think the secretary is still always a member of the investment board. But most of the members of the investment board are appointed by the governor. And um, they have, they are subject to some pressure. But the governor has always, I shouldn't say always, usually picked investment professionals who are, who are steeped in the principle of trust. That we have to look out for the people we're looking out for as investments, not for other purposes. And that's been a firewall also. I don't know if I missed any firewalls that you thought of, Dan? Uh, Mike, I mean? No? Sure. So uh, many of the Paula alums actually work for employee trust funds. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty vibrant uh, career path mm -hmm. for students. And I've always just been really impressed by the professionalism of the people who work there. Can you talk a little bit about why the employee trust funds have sort of been a, uh, an agency that is sort of renowned for professionalism and high quality public administration? Well, why is it employee trust funds been a magnet for good public employees? Uh, I, I think, you know, it's a matter of opinion, but I think there are several. One is, uh, I think, at least when I was secretary, and even before I was secretary, it's had good, ma good management. I've looked for and recruited people from other agencies that were I knew were capable and competent. Um, I don't know if it's... I don't say it's totally my recruitment skills or whatever, but the previous administrator, Max Sullivan, went out to retirement, out to Arizona to be the retirement administrator. My deputy secretary was recruited to be the administrator of the California Public Employees Retirement System. Uh, I had an executive assistant who was recruited to be the director of the Oregon State Retirement System. I had a um, Another employee was recruited to be the director of the Denver Retirement System. So I felt like, hey, I'm, we're providing a pretty good base here. And all those employees who were recruited elsewhere had previously been employees in other state departments. And they came to, with employee trust funds, maybe because I had a good reputation, I don't know. But I think more because employee trust funds had a good reputation. It was not subject to political pressure. Now, actually, I always felt political pressure as the head of the agency. But the employees, I insulated it pretty well. I took the political pressure as best I could and not, did not transmit it. And, there, I, and because of the other firewalls that we were talking about earlier, uh, people could look at the trust and say, hey, we don't have to worry about whether or not we're going to get replaced or get pressure to serve the present political notion at the moment, we will do a good job, and here's someone we can read, something we can really believe in. Now, that's my own opinion. Um, I, the one part, thing that I felt more proud of than the number of people that were recruited to other states was when I retired, the new secretary was someone I had recruited, and his replacement was someone I had recruited. And at this point, 25 years later, it isn't anybody I've recruited anymore, but <laughs> that was, I felt pretty good about that. Yes, ma'am. Um, what, is it makes, what is it that makes the trust funds attractive to the employees, you're saying? To, the, to other employees? Uh, trust funds are many, first off, they're headed by the Employee Trust Fund Board. There's also a Wisconsin Parent Fund Board and a State Teachers Board, but they, the Employee Trust Fund Board, which is, um, is not all appointed by the governor. So, so a few members are, but a lot of them are elected by the empl employees covered by the retirement system. They are very adamant about maintaining 
the retirement funds, there's another firewall I might mention, Retur retaining the retirement funds as a non-political non organization. Uh, the, no one has ever felt that the, that, that to my knowledge, ever felt that the employee trust funds was favoring Democrats or Republicans. They were doing the job for public employees and only public employees. Um, and that included for legislators and judges. Um, oh, you're talking about the investment, the investment aspects? Okay, the investment board is a separate state department. And um, when I became secretary, it was all managed internally. Uh, I, the secretary is, is, has always been a member of the investment board, but it's only one member. But uh, the, and we had a very good staff, but the concern was that we would hire someone who was really good, train them, and they'd get hired away. Just when I was leaving the investment board, the pro proposal came up that we should provide the staff with bonuses to reward them for their performance as a way of keeping the employees at the staff that we need. Um, I voted for it. I had some reluctance because I felt that it would change over time, and it has changed over time. The bonuses have grown much more larger than they were at that time. But at this point, the, we, we, don't, we can't compete with the private investment houses in total. Uh, we, we might make a good investment person might earn a million, two million dollars, but we can come high enough that we can keep good staff and develop them. Um, the in, in, investment board itself, other than the Secretary of the Employee Trust, was is primarily investment professionals. And they want to maintain their reputation as investment professionals that they've done a good job. Uh, so they do their best to see that they keep good people on staff. Now there was this trend, I can't remember the exact time, but where they started going outside management, not inside management, hiring outside firms to manage funds. Now they've reversed, they've gone back to bringing the funds back into inside management. The idea was that maybe we can get better performance by having outside managers who are more professional. They found that didn't work. Uh, they got about the same returns, and, but higher fees. And so they, they are now more or less going back into managing in, money internally. There are certain areas where they're still managing externally, where they, they say, we just can't deal with that kind of expertise, but we want to diversify into different kind of investments. But it's basically most of the management is in-house at this point. Did, is that answering your question? Okay. Yes, sir. They still, if I understood the question, the question is, don't, they still have some outside professionals in certain asset classes that they can't develop the internal uh, skills, or that it isn't economical to develop the internal skills. Um, the, and that is true, but the, um, well, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm not, I, could you repeat your question? I'm not sure I got it. I was basically kind of answering the question. Okay. Okay. So you, it, it, it wasn't really a question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's why I can't, couldn't understand the question. Okay. Don?
Um, is there something we should be doing to project the, protect the longevity of the system? Um, I, I guess the only thing I would say, uh, and I don't know the answer to your question, is a concern, could the system be corrupted, in effect? Wisconsin benefited from the progressive era. It had a lot of dedicated public employees. Um, that reflect, was reflected in the development of the retirement systems. Um, there were people, and just to give my own case, I was my 10th grade American history teacher would stand up there and preach about the ideals of the American democracy. And that really turned me on. And she wanted, she was, wanted people to go into government. And I was turned on by that. I didn't, it didn't go the way I planned on it, but because I was, my thought was I was going to be a politician. But I have to, had to recognize that I'm not a very good politician. Although being a sector employee trust funds, you are a politician. I was constantly work with unions, management, legislators, governors, taxpayer groups, and trying to say how do we put all this together to keep it working. That's a political act, activity. I was, my, I can, I guess I have to say that my idea was I was going to be in a broader field than retirement. But I would, I think that that was true of a lot of people that came with the idea of, an idea, the ideal of good government. And I, if, how would we protect it in the future? I guess we had to go for good government. Uh, and I hope that we can do it. I'm not sure we can, but we try. Yes. I can't answer that question very effectively because I haven't, as I said, I've been retired 25 years and I haven't bothered paying attention. <laughs> uh, the Wisconsin has been looked at primarily in the sense of being well funded. Other states have said, how can we get there? I was uh, contacted by a legislator from another, one of the southern states a couple of years ago uh, for information, how can we do it in our state? And after I told him what I thought was necessary, I think he decided he couldn't. <laughs> um, but it, it is held up primarily for the fact that we do have good funding. And other states are trying to get to good funding. But um, it's, uh, once you've, got, you've, you've slipped and you've got a lot of liabilities and no money, how do you raise the taxes to pay 30 40% of your payroll into the retirement system? Um, it's not, it's a hard thing to do. And there are several states that are suffering very badly by the fact that how do we fund our retirement system that we, we farm, promise all these benefits and we don't have the money to pay them. So I would say that in terms of co being copied and studied, other states have looked to see how do you, how do you manage it? And then they say, but, but it's too late. We didn't do it. And the idea is you've got to fund it in the first place. When you make a promise of benefit, you fund it. Um, and then I guess that idea is getting out there. But um, the problem is that they had promised so many benefits they didn't fund. And that's where Wisconsin really stands out. Not in the defined contribution, defined benefit combination that we have. I don't think there's anybody really tried to copy it that I know of. It came here by a virtue of our history, and I think it's a good combination. It would be good for other states to, other systems to adopt it, but that, that's not their main concern right now. Their main concern is how do we pay for the benefits we've already promised? If you were to add a defined contribution to the system they already have, some people would be getting more money out, and it doesn't, so that's not what they want to do right now. That answer your question? Yes, sir, you had a question too?
when I was work, if I understand your question, you, how did I know the, what was the right way to do it? Essentially. Well, I would say that the, when I came into the retirement, I, I started as a budget analyst, as I said, for the in '64, with the um, state budget office. At that time, I had giants ahead of me. Max Solomon was director of retirement research. He became the first secretary of employee trust funds. He was extremely good. I, I learned a lot from him. He was my boss when I, I went to the employee trust funds as executive assistant. Uh, there were, Dean Went and Dean Ingram from the UW were very involved with the retirement system. They, they were committed. They knew what they were talking about. And the Governor's Retirement Study Commission in the 40s had issued some very sound analysis of how should this be done? Why should it be done? As a budget analyst, I sat down and read all those analyses. And they were excellent. They really gave the background and the philosophy. So where, how did I know to handle it? I followed what other people had done before me. Where did they know how to handle it? I don't know. They did. I, I would like to say that something I'm credited with being the creator of the Wisconsin retirement system, and technically that is true. But one fact, I was just one of a long, long string of people working to make it work. And uh, I just happened to be there when we merged the three systems together. Maybe not, maybe a little more than just happened, but it was because it was quite a merger. But the um, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Why well, average the retirement benefit for the formula benefit over three years of salary? Originally, it was five years. Then they shortened it to three years. Uh, the idea of why not average salaries throughout the career? Well, if you average them throughout the career, you can't manipulate it. <laughs> um, I, before I retired, I was pushing what I called the fair plan which was, would it had essentially the effect, effect you're talking about. It wasn't an average year of salary, but it was basing the benefit not on what your final average salary is, but what your salary, adjusted salary throughout your career was. Uh, I wasn't able to get it through. And um, I, I would have to say that, to my mind, that's the very, one of the basic weaknesses of a formula plan. Whatever formula you pick, and it's usually a three or five year average, you're going to get distortions from indiv an individual level, and people will strive for those distortions. Um, and you do your best to avoid the distortions, but they're, they're there. And I, if we have not avoided them all. Um, I did my best. Yes, sir. Um, let me start with, you said 1.2 per 6 is a, mil is a mil multiplier factor? Yeah, what I'm saying is that um, uh, basically uh, what you would do is if uh, you took a whole year's uh, or a whole career's earnings, yeah. uh, essentially it would be uh, essentially a smaller retirement benefit is what you, know, you would be doing. It would have less pressure on the system. But isn't that muted a little bit considering that our formula multiplier is a lot lower than the national average? So well, uh, our formula multiplier is lower than the national average just because we tied it to funding. 
I think, but uh, it's not all that low. I, you, I think you said 1.26? No, it's 1.6. Okay, 1.6. Yeah. Um, you get back to a lot of how do you compare one fund and another. The formula factor is lower in Wisconsin generally than the national average, you're right. Uh, but m other plans don't have the defined contribution underneath it. And that makes a difference. Uh, we also have very good disability benefits. In total, I think that these comp just comparing the formula factor is a poor way to compare a plan. Although, if you just compare that, yes, we are below the national average, and that helps. It keeps the fund funding level up. Um, but uh, the averaging the salary for the career would not, the idea behind the defined benefit plan was that your benefit ought to be related to what your living standard was when you retired. If you average it for your career, and most people don't realize when you started, average salaries might have been $100 a month. When you retire, they're four or 5000 a month. Um, if you average that 100 with the 5000 how do you get out, where, where do you get where you want to be? How do you get there? Um, The actuary f puts wage inflation in and, pr and figure out how much the funding should be. He doesn't put it in in terms of the benefits. Um, so, yeah, the, the um, actuarial factors are, become very critical when you go to a defined benefit plan. When you go to a, on a defined contribution, they become critical only at the time of retirement, but for the defined benefit, they are critical throughout the career. Uh, did I respond adequately? I think, I think we'll have a little bit of time at the end, but we're probably coming close to the end of our time together. Uh, for, for those people who don't know, Wisconsin has an incredibly unique plan, and we, you know, we're very unlike other states, and so um, if, if you've only known Wisconsin, It is a very unique system, and it's really because of the sort of a public administration uh, prowess of, of people who've been in this system for a very long time that makes it so important. So um, anybody who's here and part of that system, thank you for that, and, and thank you to Gary, too, for sharing this today and for all your work in that fund, uh, for the fund and for us today. So thank you.